Hello and welcome to another episode of the Everything's Been Done podcast, Conversations in Cycling Subculture. I'm your host, Dustin Klein, and today's episode is brought to you by the new DCO Disruptive Commotion Overlay Camo Commotion Sticker Packs, now available for dark frames. That's right, these three color vinyl commotion stickers will transform any bicycle into a commotion camo thingamarig. Today's guest is a very special one. He is steeped in cycling subculture, has been a fixture in Northern California cycling for over two decades, is passionate about getting people on their bikes and riding. You can find him on Instagram, at California Travis. He's got some very amazing photography on there too. I'm just saying. Please join me in welcoming Mr. California Travis. Travis, thank you for being here. I'm so honored to be able to connect with you after all these years. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited to just hang out and talk to you. I have so many fond memories of us at the freewheel bike shop back in the day at night sitting there, me sitting there building wheels for you or Robert or somebody while you painted that giant mural on the wall. Yeah. And we were listening to like outcast speaker box had just come out and we would listen to it over and over again. And when that album came out, we were just like, yes, so that, that album was crazy. Nobody had put out a hip hop album like that before. And we just sat yeah. there and, you know, philosophized about life for hours while you painted and I worked on bikes and, uh, you know, I felt like I got to know your essence pretty well during that time. And, uh, I was like, that, that dude's all right. He's got a good heart. Yeah. That was so, I was thinking about that recently too. How I was like, how the fuck does this guy like, he's like, yeah, go ahead and paint a mural. Me never painted a mural. Be like, yeah, I'll paint. A yeah. <laughs> like this well, funny mix. <laughs> I had been in Italy, traveling in Italy, and there's murals everywhere there. And I was just like, man, America's so boring. All these blank walls everywhere. Like, totally. what? there needs to be more murals. You yeah. rocked it. Yeah, that was cool. You have been one of like a very, you've been like a very pinnacle person in my life in the bike world. Because you actually were, I think you were the first person or like through Freewheel to buy Cadence, which yeah. is you know, it was like instrumental and, and then the mural thing, like you've always been this very supportive and like positive and encouraging person in general. But I think also just for like cycling, it's just like, I don't know, it's really powerful and important because, you know, through that, like it spawned this whole direction in my path. And I can't imagine how many other people you've done that for as well. Yeah, when it came to messengers, trying to find a way to get out of messengering and do something creative, you know, whether it was you or like freight baggage making yeah. bags, you know, I was like, yeah, man, bring some of those things in here and let's try and sell them and get you rolling. These look great. Or frame builders, like whatever messengers have been trying to um, get out of that groove and do something new. And because like you and I both know, like messengers, some of those guys are smart as hell, like such big brains and uh, so much potential if they, you know, have a way to get it rolling. Yeah. And there's like, the, like, that's kind of one of the funny, darker sides of being a messenger is you can kind of get stuck in that like rotation. Yeah. You do it for so long. You start losing contact with the outside world and you're just like, how do I get out of this thing? Yeah, for sure. And that, was it so? I know that you were a messenger at one point. Also, what what years were those? Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of wanted to tell you a little story about me discovering bikes. Yes, awesome. It really saved saved my ass because no way. I was a punk kid, and you know, uh, just going through high school as a punk kid. And um, where was that? Uh, here in California. Chico and a little bit in New Mexico. My mom lived here. My dad lived in New Mexico and I bounced back and forth and New Mexico was brutal. It was like this little town called Alamogordo, New Mexico, which is the middle of nowhere. Total like trailer park in the middle of the desert, like nothing to do but walk out in the desert and smoke cigarettes. Very existential. Um, there were a few punks there. There were some goths there that I rode the school oh. bus with. 
these goth girls and they would like let me borrow tapes of like the cure and killing joke and dead milkman and stuff and we all had to just cool. like tape trade cool. to discover punk and there was a, a couple punks in town you know so we would just oh, you, like exchange resources and and try and help each other but for the most part it was super bleak got my ass kicked so many times just like oh, wow. walking down all people just wail on me out of nowhere just no like shit. if i had a dollar for every time i got punched and called faggot it yep. would just be like it was brutal um so and then i would bounce back and forth between there and here and here it was just like no problem you know you're a skater punk kid no problem like you can do whatever you want um wow. not get beat up continually you know um so i was living here going to high school and i graduated early and um moved to portland when i was 17 and i was living in portland and i was trying to get a job and i could not get a job and um i was looking and looking and looking and uh i was having a really hard time finding a job and i was in a really dark place um just feeling like humanity was garbage and we were destroying the planet and i didn't belong in the world you know that not being able to find a job will definitely make you feel that way and i couldn't sleep at night and i would have these these times where i just lay there in bed trying to sleep going crazy and if you've ever had insomnia you know how your brain just goes in a loop and you're just like you start to just feel crazy so i would go walk around at night in the like abandoned warehouse neighborhoods of portland and my mind was not getting any better and my mindset was not getting any better and I was just feeling really like just dystopic and like, I just didn't want to live in this world. So suicidal. And, um, so one night I decided, okay, I'm going to end it all. I'm going to go jump off this bridge. And so I, and it was pretty late. So I went to catch the bus to ride as close to the bridge as I could get. And then walk from there. Do you know which and bridge? Do you remember? It's the, the big gothic ass bridge um, over by your house. Oh, the St. John's Bridge. St. John's Bridge, yeah. Whoa, which is in like almost every single video that I do too. Yes. So people so know. That bridge, is very, that bridge is very unique to me. So um, I was living in uh, southeast, south, southeast at the time and I had to take the bus and being the middle of the night, they ran pretty infrequently. Mm -hmm. And so it took me forever to like walk to the right bus stop and then finally wait for the bus forever. And then it took me there and, and then walk to the bridge and walk to the, you know, across the bridge. And by the time I got to like the middle of it, it was, um, the sun was starting to rise oh, cool. and it was like super beautiful and oh. epic. And you know how that bridge is. And there was like no traffic because it right. was like whatever time in the morning. And it was just like, just me on this insane Gothic bridge with the sun rising and i kind of chickened out like i was just like man this is fucking epic but mostly like mostly i just kind of chickened out i was like ah, i don't know maybe maybe not today so i walked back and waited for the bus again and it was just like <laughs> such an ordeal and then I, I took the bus close to my house and as i was walking home there was a bicycle laying on the sidewalk and it was a trek antelope and um it was like blue with like splatters on it white or black splatters and it had uh like gs200 parts which were like plastic um oh. you know plastic brake levers and plastic cannies and stuff but it had hella gears and um is it um is this mountain bike or is it a road yeah, bike it bike. is okay fully rigid mountain bike like yep. we're talking mid 90s you know like uh yeah this was mid 90s early 90s maybe even um trek antelope just the, their, their cheap bike but to me i was like whoa this is fancy it's got all these gears you know and 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 it's a fancy bike it's not a like beach cruiser or something you know right um or a bmx bike or whatever so it was just laying in the sidewalk and i was just like <laughs> okay so i took it home yeah. and uh hung out that day and um still you know i was in a dark place but 
that night there was a new Fugazi record that had come out and that record well I say but it was a cassette tape so I had it on cassette tape sick yeah and I had so I had the latest Fugazi cassette and I had my Walkman and now I had this bike oh cool so I went down to the warehouse district that night and I you know put in the new Fugazi tape and I cranked it and I was like I'm just gonna ride this bike around so I was riding this bike around the warehouse neighborhood and you know I had all these gears and I didn't realize you could go that fast on a bicycle oh Um, wow you know it was just kind of like holy shit you can haul ass on these things like keep going shift the gears it goes even faster and keep trying shift and goes even faster and so I was just jamming around just flying around to me what felt like crazy speed um listening to Fugazi and I was like man this is something this is this is like worth living for you know like what can I do with this and then I was like I've seen those guys who like ride their bikes around and like it looks like they're delivering packages and stuff like I was like I should try and get that job no way you just did you notice those before Portland or I mean yeah, like, was it only in Portland that you'd seen Messengers? Yeah. yeah. Oh, because there's not that many in Portland, too. Not now, but there was back then. Well, that, not a ton, but yeah. There, that makes there sense. Was, there, when I worked at Transurf, we had probably 40 riders just oh. at um, Yeah. Yeah, so here's the thing. I was still 17, so I went down to the Messenger, you know, places and started to try to apply you know back then it was a phone book you just went to the messenger page in the phone book tore it out Sick. and then rode around <laughs> to all the different messenger places and basically everybody there just kind of laughed at me and said you have to work at transfer first and i didn't really know what that meant and then they explained like that was the shitty company and if you were a rookie then you had to start at transfer and then once you've been riding for a while you could maybe get a job at the nicer companies yeah. you know <laughs> so i was like okay whatever so I went to Transserve and they were like, oh, you're only 17. Like, you can't, we can't hire you till you're 18. And I was like, oh, okay. So I just bided my time oh. and I was working in a movie theater for a while and just waited. And then on my 18th birthday, no way. I quit my, I quit my movie theater job and I like went to Transserve and I was like, I'm 18, like Sick. hire me. And they were like, okay, weird ass <laughs> kid. <laughs> like, and I had like green dreadlocks and I had to like put my helmet on and then pull the dreadlocks through the vents in the helmet no so that, way like, that's on my head, right? <laughs> and then they wear these helmet what's called they called helmet panties they were like uh uh lycra helmet cover that yeah said tra- transurf on the side really big oh. and then it had your number on the back in case you you know got in trouble and stuff um and it was the shittiest company like um one hour deliveries they charge their customer three dollars and you got one third commission so you got a dollar for for a one hour delivery Uh, and two hour deliveries and there were four hour deliveries oh my god 25 cents (laughs) i think they might have had a rush that was a 30 minute rush but nothing you know there were no b15s or anything like that so it was like (laughs) you had to ride your ass off to make decent money at train and they called it trans slave because it was like the rookie company and stuff so uh i worked there for a while and they gave me a a route between these film development uh places Mm. that ended up being really good so i stayed there for about a year and then uh finally like got into some better companies as as usually happens you know a company will be hiring and then their riders will be like, Hey, you know, what about that guy? You know? And so I, I moved my way up and, uh, so that was cool. And that was kind of how like discovering a, a shitty Trek antelope kind of saved my ass from who knows what, I don't know what I would have done. You know, I really didn't see any future and riding my bike around for money was like, yeah, dude, this is great. Really? And I can, and I can be a crusty punk. Nobody yeah. cares that, like, you know, I have a shirt that says fuck off and I can just, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, like, I can look how, like, people expected you to be an outlaw, you know, like, as a messenger. Yeah. You know, like, people expected you to be crusty and sketchy, you know? 
I was like, oh, I'll be happy to live up to that expectation. <laughs> You're like, I've been built, as I'm designed for this. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Did it... it it, it, I'm guessing that through the messenger stuff, you started to build like a community, like a network of friends. And uh, is, is that something that was maybe not there beforehand? I had friends and I lived in a punk house. Oh, and, okay. You know, we would go to punk shows and, are, you know, play in bands and stuff. But you can't pay your rent with that. True. And when they're all asleep and you're still laying there awake, losing your mind yeah i don't know they weren't they weren't very supportive I, I remember when i came back from from going to the bridge to jump off and i told my and i was this my friend woke up in the morning to go to work and i was still awake and he was like eating his cereal and he's like he's like hey what's up i'm like oh man i just went to jump off the bridge and i chickened out and he was like you know he's eating his cereal and he's like oh <laughs> well i gotta go to work see you later i'm like I just told this guy I was going to kill myself. Yeah, what? The you fuck? Know? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I met some great friends through messengering, as I'm sure you did. Yeah. Uh, and eventually I went to visit San Francisco one year, and it was super nice in the winter. You know, it was like pouring rain in Portland and yeah. Had been for months, and then I went to visit San Francisco, and it's like sunny, and there were flowers, and I was wearing shorts, and I was like, "Why am I living in Portland, messengering so, in the rain all day? Right? When I could be messengering here in the sun, and it's San Francisco, cool, you know? Yeah. So, so I moved to SF, and it was easy, you know. I started messengering, so then I moved to oh. SF, and I did the same thing, you know. It was like still pre-internet, so it was like, go to the phone book, both tear out the messenger yeah. page, and then <laughs> ride around like to all the different places so i just wrote around and um applied at a bunch of different places and then the very next day i got a call from maria at pelican courier in in san francisco and she's kind of a legend or was um she was super mean and you know she called me up is this travis t and i was like yeah and she's like you looking for a job and i was like yeah like, well, get your ass down here i was like okay well, this lady's crazy. <laughs> so I went down and she wouldn't give me a radio because she didn't trust me. So I had to do the old school shit where you like go to do a delivery and then call in over no. like a landline. Yeah, like what? New York style, old school New York style where like you go and do your delivery and then like call in on a payphone and be like, hey, I dropped off. And like, okay, like go pick up this or call me in 15 or something and i was like okay can i get a radio and she's like no nah, i don't know you and i was like yeah oh. dude what the <laughs> fuck <laughs> yeah so i had to like prove to her for a while that she could trust me with a radio and then she finally gave me a radio and she learned to trust me and it was fine yeah um, you're probably like a better worker than half the people there and she's like oh so yeah i guess you're all right oh no, she realized very quickly because yeah. i was like total like one of those guys who wanted to do as many deliveries as possible i wasn't like just hanging out at the wall i was like give me more give me more i want to make money um yeah were you motivated by the i not i don't know maybe it was the money or just to see how many you could do i definitely got in some competitions in the past with other messengers on how many tags we could do in one day so, do, you, do you remember your record uh there was one day that was crazy high and it was because I was actually, ironically, I was riding a basket bike, like a cruiser basket bike. What? And my dispatcher was like, Hey, I have a pickup where it's 50 pickups. <laughs> at the time. And, and I was like, I had my Zoe bag and a basket. So I just went and picked up a hundred tags and then just <laughs> rode around delivering them. And I don't know if that was my record, but I remember being like, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all one pickup, too. You know, you didn't have to go right. uh, drop it off. It was just like drop, 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 drop. I don't know if you ever got sucked into that kind of like mindset, but I did a little bit. But mostly I was just stoked to be exploring this amazing city by bicycle and getting paid for it, you know? Yes. You'd have a delivery to Russian Hill, and you're just like, wow, okay. And totally. You'd have, a you'd have a delivery to all these different neighborhoods that you didn't even know existed, you know? And then 
with their own their own little downtowns almost sometimes you know you go to noe yeah. valley and be like whoa crazy and uh, so that was rad so i was into that yes yeah, san francisco is like such a cool city just as a whole so like therefore being a messenger in that city is like such a special experience because it's all these pockets the whole city's small it's really dense it's kind of maze like it's not just a grid which ugh, like gets old real fast yep um but okay wait i feel like you were you were on to something and then i started asking you stupid questions about how many tags you could do <laughs> yeah, i don't know if i really was i was just saying yeah i was enjoying messengering in sf and uh again it was like a culture where you're expected to kind of be a an outlaw in, in a way and so you know no one was surprised if you were like fuck you buddy you know like they're like oh isn't it take a picture that is the bike messenger <laughs> yeah san francisco bike messenger you know and this was before food delivery oh yeah oh, this was when it was all legal work and pre-press and design work so it was really good money wow. by the end when i was working at espresso god it's just like you just show up for a slow day and you'd make a hundred bucks you know like that was wow. just showing up for a dead day so when you were cruising around busting b15s all day um it was really good money like fat money and like Damn, you that's... did not deliver food like people if you showed up and like it was like a food delivery people would literally just be like what i don't deliver food i'm out of here like right yeah yeah be like no I don't get like sauce in my bag. Like I carry important documents in there. Documents, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm important. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. So, so did you kind of find that you were, you know, do, after messenger life kind of has like a time limit to it. Like you yeah. kind of, it's like the greatest job in the world. And then it turns into like the worst thing you could ever imagine. It, it, it that was my experience and i feel like i'd seen that in a few other people too is that kind of what started to happen for you yeah i was interested in doing other things too you know i while i was doing that i was working at maximum rock and roll magazine for oh, a while, cool. doing like zine reviews and some record reviews and a little bit of interviewing for them and then uh actually ended up working in suicide prevention hotline which was pretty funny oh that's awesome i was doing a delivery to suicide prevention hotline one day uh in downtown san francisco and as i was doing the delivery i was like so what's the deal with this place and um the lady was like oh this is a hotline you know this is the suicide prevention hotline for san francisco and i was like huh how does it work to like start working here and stuff she's like are you interested and i was like yeah kind of and she was like come sit down for a second. And I was like, okay. Whoa. And she was like, have you ever had any experience with this kind of a thing? And I was like, you know, I told her my, the story I just told you. And I was like, yeah, I've definitely felt suicidal for, for sure. Many times. Um, and she was, but I felt like this young punk messenger who didn't really know shit and certainly not qualified to talk on the phone to anybody else about it. Um, but she was right. like, well, here's how it works. You take these classes oh. and once you've taken those and you're you know we sign off on on you then you work here um and it's volunteer work so you don't get paid um unless you do night shifts you get paid for um and i was like okay that's interesting and she's like let's do it let's sign you up right now and i was like i don't know man I don't, i'm just like i don't i'm not that's not me I, I mean, it's inter it's interesting. I was interested, but I don't think I'm qualified for that. She's like, no, I think you are. Let's do it. So I'm like, okay. So she, yeah. So she was like, well, you have to pay for the classes. And I was like, oh, I don't have that money. She was like, okay, well, you don't have to pay for the classes. And I was like, Sick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so she like waived the classes and I went to them and I did them. I took the classes. That's really great. Super fascinating classes, like really interesting and not really what I had expected um, that you would learn. Um, most of working at a suicide prevention hotline is like listening and, and instead of, you know, you're not really like trying to like be like, you have so much to live right. for, you know, like you're not really like trying to talk people into anything so much as just hear them out and just be like, you know, the classic is kind of like, well, how did that make you feel? And, you know, interesting kind of just listening and being there for people. 
so I took the classes and I started working there and I did a lot of night shifts there while I was messengering. Oh, wow. Both. Um, yeah. So that could be long messengering all day and then working there at night. Um, but it was cool. And, uh, eventually they wanted me to work more and more and they were trying to pay me to do it and stuff. And then I was like, that's ah, too much. And, uh, so I just quit, but it was interesting. Did, do you feel like that work? Like I hear about that, I think that it would be almost depressing to do that work, or was it maybe the opposite? Uh, no, sometimes it was. Yeah, I heard some pretty gnarly stories. Right. Uh, and you know, it's downtown San Francisco at night in this office building that overlooks downtown SF. So you really Whoa. were like sitting there, looking out over the city, talking Whoa. to people who were bumped. But most of the time, people who pick up the phone, they want to be talked out of it. You know, yeah. Like, if, if you're picking up a phone, you want help usually, you know, like for sure, for sure. So, so you already, you're along the right path or you're trying to be. So it was depressing, but it was good work. You know, it, it, it felt like a good thing to do and a good thing to be there for. Did you ever, yeah. did you ever meet any of the people that you helped through like no. randomness? Because no. San Francisco is a small city, too. I know. I always wondered if that would happen. Um, but usually you wouldn't talk to people more than once or twice. Um, yeah, that makes... That seems... I don't know. Well, yeah. And that's pretty big. So, yeah, just somewhere out there. I did have, actually, one time I was... I got a call, and it was from the Golden Gate Bridge, the people who worked on the Golden Gate Bridge. And they were like, you know there's those call boxes on Golden Gate Bridge? Yes other ones yeah so someone had picked one of those up and so they're like they're like hey we have a call like just keep them on the phone and i was like okay and so i'm like talking to someone who's on the golden gate bridge you know and they're freaking out and i'm like just keeping them on the phone and we're talking and all of a sudden I, they're talking like blah 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 and all of a sudden i hear just hear oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is them being tackled scuffle yeah workers and then the bridge workers are like okay we got them thanks click uh, so, yeah you're like i don't know if this is helping <laughs> yeah yeah well they did pick up the phone but that's true yeah wow yeah i had no idea that you ever did that good for <laughs> you that's fucking really cool that's, that's like interesting. I mean, I, you, know, you saved some to, lives. Yeah, I don't want to try and take credit like that I was trying to do the right thing necessarily. It was mostly out of my own curiosity. I, so. I say, same set, you know, like that curiosity led to doing some good in the world. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's that's doing it. I mean, at least at that moment, you know, beyond that, it's it's up to everybody else. Then it's it's out of your and mine everybody else's control you know yeah so i did that and then and then eventually i started working at the free wheel bike shop um yeah i was curious if did you how did that start how did you get involved with that <clears throat> um well i bought this frame i bought a track frame in new york actually for 125 bucks i bought a richard Sachs track frame oh sick and uh this was before anybody knew what track bikes were for or anything yeah, when I was a messenger, there were maybe five people riding track bikes. Oh, then. interesting. Like Eric Zoe, Richie Ditta, Danny Boy, Eric Zoe's dad, <laughs> you know, maybe like two other people. Wow. You know? Yeah. So anyways, I bought, oh, Pez, of course. Oh, cool. And uh, I was visiting Pez in New York once, actually, and bought a... Richard Sachs track frame for 125 bucks, brought it back to SF, and I needed a bottom bracket for it. So I took it to the Freewheel bike shop uh, on Valencia Street and was like, yo, can you put a bottom bracket in this? And then and the owner was like, yeah, no problem. And then like I came back a few days later, and I was like, all right, we good? And he was like, oh, no. <laughs> I got the, the deal. I got to do that. No, I didn't do it, but I'll do it. And I was like, okay, it's all good. And then, you know, I went back a few days later and I was like, um, all right, you get that thing down. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah, I got to. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, do you need some help in here? And he's like, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Can you? Can, yeah. Do you want to work? And I was like, OK. So I started working on weekends. So then I was messengering and then working there. And, uh, and then I just ended up transitioning out of messengering oh. the bike shop. 
full time. So, yeah. Just kind of got sucked into that, the industry side. Right. Yeah. Did you have any like mechanic experience at that point or did you? Wow. As a crusty punk working on my own bike, the way I used to uh, learn how to work on my bike was I would go to bike shops and I would dig in the garbage and I would find the instruction sheets that came with parts. Oh, cool. So like Shimano had the best ones. Like, so I would literally dumpster dive bike shops for the instructions and, and save them all up. So I had this big pile of like instructions. So, like, if I needed to adjust my derailleur, I would dig out the instructions for a, a derailleur, and it would be like, oh, B-tension screw does this, and limiter screws, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I kind of learned how to work on bikes with that. What? That is awesome. Top, dude, that is, like, such a DIY, punk rock, resourceful, like, way to approach that. That's so cool. Yeah, but... Look, starting at the bike shop, it was like a lot of jobs where you realize you actually don't know shit. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're <laughs> like, like, here, fix this so thing. You're like, what is that thing? Yeah, so I had a lot to learn. I had built my own wheels already and stuff, but oh. I had a lot to learn. And luckily, I had some good people working with me that, that had the patience and took the time to teach me. So. Yeah, well, and it's they just needed help, right? So then just kind of learn on the fly and then just, yeah, yeah maneuver through yeah. it. Ah, interesting. And then was the the Freewheel Valencia was the first one then? For no, some Freewheel Hayes was the first oh, one. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah. So the Freewheel Freewheel Hayes has been there since the 70s. And, oh, that's um, so sick. Yeah. So Freewheel Valencia just opened when I started working there. Got there it. Was tiny. There was barely anything in there. Um, and I worked at Freewheel Valencia for a couple of years and then went and took over Freewheel Hayes as um, – Oh, they needed somebody to run it and it was like it was dying and it needed help so they sent me up there to, to try and bring it back to life to the time. oh dude i would say that you a hundred percent did that like you gave that place that so when i came to san francisco and was doing messenger work travis was already there with free wheel haze and it was this it was like the place that travis brought so much like good vibes and energy and just funny and like sharp and good aesthetics and it was also this really cool meeting place there were stands where people could work on their bikes you could have them do mechanic work they'd buy new stuff it was this perfect place and no matter where you lived in the city a lot of people would still go to Hayes to just be part of that it was like a nucleus of culture of like, you know not just messenger but like bike culture san francisco bike culture tangent <laughs> no, it's, it's true. The thing, the thing that helped with that shop was fixed gears were starting to blow up, and nobody knew what the hell it was about, and didn't know how to do it, and what you know, nobody knew what what was up with fixed. None of the shops did. You know, they were all like your basic bread and butter bike shops. They were like, you know, we have the track bikes and specialized helmets. You know, and, yeah. Fixed gears, they had no idea how it worked, and they were blowing the fuck up. Right. And I did know how they worked, so it was easy. And, you know, actually, Pez was the first person to come in and say, I want Philwood hubs, tra track track hubs, and I want them laced to these velocity rims, these deep dish rims. And I was like, weird, okay, like, sure, like, let's do it. So sick. Yeah, and so that was the very first pair in SF, the first pair of Philwood hubs and velocity rims um, to ever get laced for him. And eventually, I think we probably, I don't know how many of those we laced. I had, I had, I called Philwood every day. I would call and order from them. And wow. same with velocity. Like, it really became a track bike hub um, for SF because nobody else knew how to do it and, and, and what was up. We were definitely on it, you know. We were like, we had track frames in stock. We had track hubs. We had, we were down to sit there and color coordinate with people, you know. As it moved from messengers to hipsters, yeah, there was a lot of like, I want purple rims and I want green hubs and I want white spokes and and we were like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Mostly because it was just like, damn, we are making a lot of money, like. This is wow. crazy because all that shit was really expensive. Yeah. You know, and and so we were just 
stuffing so much money. Um, so, and we were like down to, to take the time to talk to people and go custom on stuff and do crazy spoke patterns and stuff. And, and so, yeah, so it was kind of a track bike hub for a while. And then, uh, we had some customers that wanted to start a team, a cycling team. Oh. And I was like, well, what kind of team do you want to do? And they were like, we want to do a cyclocross team. And I was like, well, that's weird. Okay. Um, that's a really niche sport, which yeah. at the time was super niche. Right. It was like only the nerdiest of nerds were doing cyclocross. It was like <laughs> roadies, roadies in the off season and like other like deep bike nerds were doing it. But it was not popular at all. No, gravel bikes were not yeah. a thing. Um, so it was this really weird and I didn't really know much about it. So I was like, all right, yeah, let's do it. And so we started. started (laughs) Love it. I started going to races and, and they were like really small, you know, like tiny, tiny races, barely anybody there, you know, and it was, uh, deep bike nerd stuff and not cool at all. At least in my mind, I was like, this is cool. Um, but that was kind of, was cool that it wasn't cool um and it was really fun um just because it was so much chaos you know it was like that was back when races were in golden gate park and stuff and it was just like you ride your bike down this thing and try not to crash before you take a right into the bushes and then you know do this and it just seemed really chaotic so it was fun and we had fun with the team and it was going really well and i'd never run a team before so that was super fun and interesting and then um Hunter Cycles had a cyclocross team and they had a rad team and the riders actually suggested we should join these two teams and make them one team. And I was like, yeah, if you guys are want to do that. That sounds cool. So I, we talked to Rick Hunter about it and um, he was down. So then it became Freewheel Hunter and, um, and that was a cool ass team. And it was just a, a lot of really cool, like, deep bike culture people involved um so that was super fun yeah and that and that was one thing i was going to say about freewheel and then it ties into this is freewheel really had the culture side of it wasn't just a bike shop that had good inventory like you guys and specifically you because you were kind of the one driving that ship is you understand that understood the culture of of track bike and cycling and I don't know, like I have such an appreciation for subcultures and things like that. And you're one of the few people where it like really pinpoints into. And I don't know, I just have so much respect for that. And it's cool to be like, oh, this person is able to create this influence, but not in like this like influencer way, more of just like creating a space, sharing knowledge and perspective with people and then letting that go out and like influence like culture. And so it's, it's, I didn't quite know the uh, cycle cross stuff. So you did it with like through the track bike and then, then the cycle cross and like, and it's just, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying you're like, Oh, these new trends. Like it's definitely not that it's, it's almost like you're drawn to like the genuineness of something. Like when you yeah. say nerdy, I think genuine because nerd is not trying to prove shit. It's just like love for something. Yeah. That's yeah, that's really that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Like all the people that were involved in cyclocross at that point were just the biggest bike nerds. And I love yeah. that. Ex- exactly. And, and as far as community, like I definitely love bringing people together like and watching them interact you know my favorite thing is like this person's rad and this person's rad and now they're on the same team and look at them interacting together like that that's awesome you know like um so that was good it was the people that we brought on the team was never about who was fastest it was like who we really liked as an ambassador you know and uh for the culture and you know it was a person who would after a race, go up to the person they are racing against and be like, oh man, you were killing it. You know, that was awesome. What happened? Oh, you got a flat. What tire are you running? What pressure? Yeah. Oh, man, try this. You know, like those are always my favorite people who will like beat you and then like go try and help you beat them. You know, like, yeah, that's few, sick. I've known a few bike racers like that. Um, 
there was a guy who used to smoke me in time trials every time and then he would come like talk to me about it afterwards you know and be like try and help me get wow. faster and i would always like oh, this guy is the man you know it's so cool yeah that is it's just, yeah like just through the the passion of it yeah so those were always the type of people we tried to bring on instead of like people who were like deeply competitive you know totally it, I, I remember you were like at one point like very dedicated to road racing mm-hmm. was that around this time so then then i got sucked into road racing and uh did that for a while and that was mostly like a personal challenge kind of a thing to see like how far i could take it from being like a cigarette smoking bike messenger to like how 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 far can I take my own like personal fitness? Yeah. Fitness. Yeah. So that was kind of an experience and I, and I definitely got sucked into it and, um, and did really well and, and kept upgrading and, and, and had fun doing it. And in in hindsight, I I can't imagine doing it because it's just so rigorous and all the training involved and road riding just seems so boring to me these days. But, um, (laughs) Yeah. At the time, it was kind of like a challenge. I love challenges. And so it was fun to, to do that and see how far I could take it. And um, it was really fun. And I did a lot of stage racing was fun and, and stuff. And oh, eventually okay. I made it to Cat 2. And I was two points away from Cat 1. And then I broke my leg really bad in a crash. And then at the time, upgrade points would expire. Oh. And so I broke my leg really bad. And while I was recovering like really bad like i had to like you know do the thing where you go to the hospital and they're helping you learn to walk again you know the inspiration it's playing um (laughs) so i did that and all my points expired in the meantime oh what a Uh, slap in the face it was just like like, what the fuck i don't remember if it was 30 35 points whatever it was it was just like (laughs) yo that took me like a year of like riding my ass off to get those points like do i want to do that again like yeah and like the only difference between cat one and cat two you're still doing the same races anyways pretty much you're racing together and cat one like maybe it's more enticing to get picked up by a pro team at that point and i was like would i even want to race pro it's just like you're suffering so much it's just like always suffering it's just like go stand in that fire and feel your legs burn for hours you know yeah (laughs) And I was like, I'm going to go ride bikes in the dirt and enjoy oh. nature and stuff. And that was when I kind of transitioned to where I'm at now, where it's just like, I'm going to go ride in dirt. I'm going to see a cool flower and I'm going to hit the brakes and I'm going to stop. and I'm going to look at it. And I'm going to be like, that's cool. Instead of like having to be like, I got to keep going. My, you know, right. My interval isn't complete, you know, like, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, just enjoy. I, that's one thing about road riding is I really discovered getting out there training like how my love for the outdoors and where a bike could take you and how far a bike could take you oh, you know oh yeah and you you go wow yeah i rode a lot but like when you have a four and a half hour ride and you just go out of the city and you realize how freaking far you can get that's yeah. really like also very empowering to be like wow i can really get out there and if i'm on a bike that goes into nature i can get way out into nature and see these beautiful places that i wouldn't see normally and so i got hooked on riding in nature at that point yeah and there's i i mean i feel like i've noticed this there's still that challenge of like surviving the ride you know (laughs) like go out into nature and do this crazy thing and then like you know get back before the sun goes down so there's still you know it doesn't have to be road riding seems so very like angular and just like cha 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 and but there's still a lot of similar components in there too, for, uh, to like long distance off road stuff. Yeah, totally. Like being able to navigate, like how are you going to totally. navigate in this place where there's no cell service and and have all the tools and repair stuff that you need, fuel and self sufficiency that's involved. I think exactly. that's something I try and talk to a lot of people about is like trying to enable them to get out is is learning to use map apps that don't re- need a cell service you know learning what to bring mechanically 
so that you can be self-sufficient enough to really get out there to some of those magical places. Yeah, that is like brings up a to me it reminds me like uh, uh, ugh, excuse me learning a lot of those things have been through trial and error from my experience like oh bonk oh flat tire oh like this thing break and then you're like okay these are the things that you need to survive these big rides but totally. obviously when you're new you don't know so someone like you can be like hey here here's all these things that really they're basically essential they'll seem weird because you've not had not needed them but if you yeah. do need them it is like the difference between moving and not moving yeah, that's something I missed from working at the bike shop was helping educate people and empowering them to do whatever the hell it is that they wanted to do, whether that's riding a track bike around San Francisco to getting out on, in the nature on a mountain bike or like halfway through a cyclocross race. Like I love helping, you know, educate and empower people like that. I miss that doing that for sure. That's fun. Yeah, right. And then because you can see their progress, too. Yeah. If they've decided to take the information. <laughs> yeah. And maybe teach you something too, you know? Oh, right. For sure. Teaching is like one of the greatest ways to like learn mm -hmm. things that you maybe don't know and don't know. Totally. So then uh, freewheel and then you started doing fresh air. And it was that during like, were you still road racing at that time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, As so it was. I was still road racing, and I at that point we had our own little road team kind of. Yes, and yep. uh, I remember. Yep. So then I uh, bought uh, Fresh Air Bicycles and, and was running that shop, and and um, we had our cyclocross team and a road team, oh, so two teams, which was wow. a lot, and um, that was fun. Um, and then I came and visited uh, Chico. Uh, which is where I kind of spent some time growing up and it's so beautiful here. And um, I, it's so much closer to nature. You know, we're right at the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains Sick. and um, you know, it's, it's just the weather here is like super sunny and hot and, and it's just a beautiful place. There's a Creek that runs through it. And, um, There's hot springs. No, there, well, there's, there are hot springs a little ways away, but um uh, just the hot weather. I like the yeah. hot weather. And uh, so I had an opportunity to walk, work at Paul Component, which is a, a factory here in Chico that makes bicycle parts. And um, yeah, cool. that was kind of my end. So we moved here. Me and my partner moved here. And I started working there. And um, so, yeah, now I work at Paul and um, ride bikes in nature as much as I can. And, uh, you know, yesterday it's there's a big park, like you can hop on your bike here at the house. So yesterday is a great example of like my perfect day. Work till about four, get on my bike, ride up to Upper Park, which is uh, just a park that kind of goes up into the foothills of the mountains. And there's a beautiful creek that runs through there that's perfect for swimming. So, you know, ride single track up there, mountain biking, uh, stop, go swimming, jump in the creek and, uh, you know, float around, look at a really cool red dragonfly that's like mostly clear, Whoa. but like bright orangish red and uh, some cool flowers and then ride back on single track. And um, that's just dreamy to me. It just seems like a dream come true. So um, I'm really happy with that. And working at Paul Component is awesome um, because it's like an American manufacturer, which I really stand by. And um it's just a, it's really neat uh, company because everything's being made right here in Chico. You know, like these big aluminum bars come in one door and finished bike parts in their packaging go out the other door. And that's really easy to like be stoked on and believe in. Yeah, it, it is like it's a pretty special company in that way. It seems similar to Chris King with like American raw goods into a finished thing. There's what else is there? I mean, I'm sure there's something, but those are the two that I think of for bicycle. White Industries. Oh, really? They're all U.S. made. Oh, definitely. They're small like us. Like, we're a small company. We we typically are 12 to 14 people. Right now, oh, wow. with COVID in place, we're oh, like yeah. six people or something. Oh. Um, 
but yeah, we're really small, and so is White Industries. Uh, Velocity makes their rims in the United States. That's cool. Um, Will Smith still makes some spokes in the U.S. Oh, DT wow. Swiss has an actual American spoke factory, as far as I know. Uh, who else is making parts in the U.S.? Uh, there's some frame builders making handlebars, obviously. Auri makes their grips in the U.S. Oh, cool. Uh, I should know this because I've tried to build bikes that are like all American made. And I feel like the only thing I can't get American made at this point is tires, tubes. Uh, Not that anybody makes tubes, but tires, pedals. Oh. At least flipless pedals. Oh. Uh, and seats. Oh, interesting. I think those are the only ones I, I haven't been able to find. But everything else, like my, I have a couple bikes that are all, oh, and drive, obviously it's a geared bike, drivetrains, you know. Cassettes. Yeah, stuff yeah. like that. But I have a single speed hmm. where I think the only thing that's not American made is the tires and the seat and the pedals, but everything else is American. Is that that awesome lightning bolt? Yeah. Oh my God. This bike is what is this thing like <laughs> can you explain it a little bit well so my buddy cameron falconer from Cam from falconer cycles was living in fairfax while i was living in san francisco and i would always mm -hmm. uh drive over to fairfax and we'd go mountain biking on mount tam and at the time he was about an hour away in in fairfax so i'd be in san francisco and i'd be like hey you want to ride bikes on saturday yeah okay cool so i would drive to fairfax and take about an hour and then we'd go mountain biking on Tam, and then I'd drive back. Now, when I moved to Chico, he moved to Quincy, which is where Grindero has typically been, um, and lost and found and stuff like that. So he moved to Quincy, so now that's about an hour and a half drive. So now I can drive an hour and a half and be to, you know, Plumas National Forest, which is epic. Anyone who's done Grindero or lost and found knows um, that that area is, like, epic Sierra riding. Um, so we've uh shared a lot of time together and he's built a lot of bikes for me and that was a single speed that he built and it was kind of like a i want to build a bike with as many paul parts as possible as much american made parts as possible and i had it painted by a, a famous guy here in chico and all paul parts and um it was kind of meant to be like a show bike but uh i ride the shit out of it i ride it this is my swimming hole bike oh, so. so the like the look of the bike that was very unique it kind of has like a, i think of it as like a clunker kind of vibe yep but it's like a modern version of that yeah it was designed to emulate a cook brothers cruiser which was a super early progenitor of mountain bikes before mountain bikes there were some people building like these like cruiser mountain bikey things out of like the larkspur area oh um, interesting and it was designed to emulate that with like the dual top tube and loop tail stays and stuff and oh, um, wow. and very clunkery looking, but uh, all modern parts, you know. Uh, and then the paint job has this amazing lightning through it. The handlebars have like a lightning bolt. Is that right? Yeah. Dude, the yeah. Oddity Cycles, man, that guy is the best. He just was like, you need one of my handlebars on there. And I was like, yeah, I do. Sick. Like, <laughs> I would love to have an American-made handlebar on my American-made bike. And, and he he was like, what do you want? And I was like, I don't know, whatever you think goes with it. And then, of course, he sends me a titanium bar with, like, a lightning bolt oh. crossbar. And, yeah, all these people kept on commenting, like, you're going to, like, oh, kill yourself. Your turn them on that thing or whatever. And it's like, good. I hope I die happy. Like, <laughs> everybody's got something to say. It fucking rules. Um, uh, what's the name of that bike? It's an interesting Krusty Diamond. If so, you search Krusty Diamond, you'll find photos of it. It's fucking yeah, awesome. Google Krusty Diamond with a K, and it'll oh. pop up. And um, it's been Dirt Rag did a write up on it. Radivus did a write up Sick. on it. And um, it, it handles really well too. I mean, it looks like oh, it's a show bike for nabs or something. But um, that's one of my favorite riding bikes actually the way it handles like i've taken on some pretty gnarly single track before where oh. it's like uh fully rigid single speed is really not appropriate for this trail but it's like really really agile like something about the way he did the geometry on it it's like super super able like up and over stuff and very three-dimensional riding it's like really really able so 
Oh, fascinating. Um, yeah, that bike. I think I need to be buried with that bike, maybe, you know? Oh, the that coffin might, will match? It'll that be... might be one. Yeah, that might be the bike. To be <laughs> up now, it's all scratched. Oh, is it? Up and dirty and... It's like, yeah, it's going to get fucked up, you know? Yeah, like, I, I, I'm i definitely on your, I'm on in your camp on that. But there is times I'll look at, like, the stinner or something. It gets, you know, I'm just kind of like, am I doing Ooh, this wrong? When you, bikes get fucking worn out when you ride them. Like, it's just how it is, you know? Yeah, it hurts, though, that first big chip in the paint. And you're always just like, oh, Christ. You're like, all right, all right. And, like, upper park is full of rocks. So if you dump your bike in the pile oh. of rocks. Oh man, there's like five giant chunks out of the paint and a giant, you know, there goes the anno on the cranks and everything. It, it really is like <laughs> pretty bad. All the, all the rocks have like aluminum and like paint. <laughs> like long oh, areas. really? Like, yeah, there'll be like a chute and the rocks on both sides are just covered in paint and aluminum from bikes. Oh just my. Through there. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. But, you know, the one, the flip side of that is uh, through Messenger, I, I've gained such an appreciation for just, like, well-used things. Yeah. Like, Messenger bikes, like, fucking cool if they're, like, cool. yeah. yeah. Wow. All the chips from, like, a U-lock and, like, yep. personality, character. And you've got to earn all those dings and nicks. Like, you can take that beautiful thing and just put it on the wall and that's beautiful and fine, but... It's not going to have, like, you have to use it to get the the patina, you know? Yeah, so They gain, like, their own, like, epic identity at a certain point. Like, bikes I like, like your Decordy or whatever, you know? It's yeah. like, there are bikes that's like, oh, that bike, like, was blah, 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 owned it. And then they, like, it got stolen in New York. Right. And blah, 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 and came back. And then, you know, like, I love <laughs> bikes that tell, like, stories like that. It's so cool. Yeah, that sounds like city, city. People that live in cities have bike stories, like some messengers specifically. Yeah, like, totally. What um have you been, you've been riding mostly, do you have like a, yeah, what have you been riding mostly recently? So right now um, with COVID lockdown, I've been working from home. And uh, usually, usually by this time of year, I would have gone up to Quincy and Downeyville, you know, uh, six, Eight, 10 times by now because it's just it's so nice to go up there it's so close like i said yeah, hour and a half to hour. quincy hour 45 to downeyville so wow. that's that's where normally i'd be trying to go ride um i'm trying to be safe about exposing other communities with covid and so forth uh i've been really like being a real nerd when it comes to covid compliance um i've been one of those mega nerds about it and um so I've been riding a lot more locally than I normally would. Mm. Um, but and that's okay. I think right now it's not about focusing on where you can't ride, but focusing on where you can ride. It's not about doing what you normally do. It's about doing what you can do totally. and find, finding new things to do. Um, so I pulled out my gravel bike a lot more than I actually had had been previously. And just sometimes I'll get off work and I'll just be like, I need to ride. I need to get, I just need to go ride my bike. And um, where am I going to go? And I can't even fucking think of where I'm going to ride. My brain is so melted. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just get on the bike and start riding and just see where it takes me. And there are a lot of levees around here because there's all these uh, orchards uh, towards the Sacramento River from us. Sacramento River is not very far. And there are a lot of um, nut orchards, almonds, walnuts, rice fields. Um, various crops but mostly orchards um mostly nut orchards and uh there's a lot of levees that run along those gravel levees and those are really good for riding oh, because yeah. there's no traffic there's no other people and you can just jam along these gravel levees for as far as you want in various directions and it's really pretty and if you want you can go just dip into an orchard and hang out in the shade for a while or go to the Sacramento river and just kind of explore that area. So I've been doing that a lot more than normally I would be up in the Sierras, like Lake Basin area or something. Um, but I've been kind of exploring our local, the agricultural Valley and the, and the Sacramento river. There's some interesting, like kind of, uh, estuaries along the Sacramento river that I hadn't explored. Oh yeah. Um, 
otherwise riding my bike up into the foothills of the Sierras and my motorcycle up into the foothills of the Sierras. Um, so exploring up in that direction. Um, at some point I might try doing some day trips up to Quincy where they're super self-supported. So I don't have to go expose the community, but I can still ride up there. So that would mean like fill a cooler full of lunch and drinks and food and all that, fill the gas tank here in Chico, drive to Quincy. I've done this before, actually parked at the bottom of Huff, Mount Huff, you know it, ridden up, mountain bike down it, had a blast, get back in the car. I got my food and I got my drink. I still got enough gas to get back to Chico, drive oh. back. I don't have to even go into town. Um, that sounds awesome. Yeah. So I can do that. So it's about time to start doing it. I mean, it get, riding solo though, it's, it's like, it's heavy. You're just like, yeah. fuck man. Yo, it is. It's it crazy. Is. I'm, I'm allergic to bee stings and I keep getting stung by bees and each time it's worse. <laughs> and last time I got stung by a wasp, I had to go to the ER. Oh um, shit. Yeah, and I was riding with some buddies. Um, so luckily we all like, I was like, yo, I just got stung by a wasp and I think it's gonna be gnarly. And we're like, okay, we gotta ride to the bottom of the parking lot and then blah, 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 we'll get in the car and drive to the emergency room, you know. It was fine um, and we handled it. But now riding by myself, it's like- Way riskier. What if I get stung? That's yeah. Like, fuck, man. Um, and it's really heavy and it's like, I can't let that stop me from riding like so it's kind of it's like i carry an epi pen and a bunch oh. of drill and stuff and but it's like it's kind of like <laughs> it's, it's like at a certain point you have to be like if i die i die doing what i love i'm not gonna stop doing what i love it's as corny as that sounds like it's like i can't let certain things stop me from doing what i love and if i if that means me dying doing those things at least i was dying doing them Instead of sitting at home being like, oh, wish I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I guess the, 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 <laughs> the shittier version would be to not die, but to suffer for a very long time <laughs> and then still live. <laughs> that's, more, that's more likely to be honest. I'm sure. I'm fine, <laughs> yeah. but it's just, it's, oh, every time I, it happens, it's worse. Like, it's, yeah, that sucks. That's, scientifically for some reason every time it happens it gets worse and i just kept getting stung over and over again you know and i'd be like what the hell i'd be like yo i got stung three times this year my friend would be like i haven't been stung in like six years you yeah know? and i'd be like it's just what happens when you're outdoors all the time i guess i don't know yeah i mean covers arm cover leg warm uh, not a bad idea i mean does it would it help is basically Probably. So, Probably. It's yeah, something? It's like I'm not getting stung through my clothes. It's like on exposed skin usually. So you need like winter gear? You need like a beekeeper <laughs> outfit to ride in. <laughs> and like a, the puffer of smoke that you can have and just like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Know, the flu or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's other people. I would love to hear from other people who have experienced that. If anybody's watching this, reach out to me and holler at me about your experience with that because I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. I mean, if anybody else is like, yeah, I carry this and I do this, like I would love to hear some advice from anybody out there. Uh, that's a good a good uh, reach out. Someone would be like, yeah, you just take a raw onion and a can of oh. Dr. Pepper and what, what? you got to do. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> you rub it all over everything. Yep. Um, uh, kind of a silly, stupid question, but how many bikes do you have? Five. I just counted yesterday. That's it? Yeah, I was about to build. I was thinking about building another one, and I was like, I don't have room for any more. But uh, yeah, just five. I've got gravel bike, city bike, single speed mountain bike, geared mountain bike. Oh, and then a coaster brake mountain bike. So five. And then it, the gravel bike now, but normally would you be on the mountain bike? And then I'm assuming mountain bike is hardtail? Hardtail, yeah. Um, yeah, I alternate. Right now I'm alternating between mountain bike and gravel bike. So, like, yesterday I rode my mountain bike to go swimming. And then, uh, you know, uh, yeah, just alternating between gravel. And my gravel bike is actually my ex cyclocross race bike. 
Oh, um, it's a hunter. So it's, yeah, it's my old hunter team oh, bike. Cool. So it doesn't have a ton of room. Like the fattest tire that'll fit is a forty, and even that mm. kind of like rubs on the chainstay if you get oh. sideways on it. Yeah, so not enough to stop me from doing it, but uh, at some point I should probably build like a real a gravel a bike with fatter gravel tires. Yeah, that's a cool. So what what would be like an optimal tire for you? I don't know, maybe like a. 50 or something i don't know oh. i still gotta figure that out the 40 is nice for what i've been doing which is just gravelly stuff but, yeah like smooth road yeah or just straight gravel road or whatever yeah, yeah. uh <clears throat> recently i've been trying 45s on a 700c and it it's like a nice like kind of happy medium i wouldn't say they have that be like a cap but that ratio I w i've been pretty surprised with actually that seems, it's funny, I was about to say 45 seems like a sweet spot for me. Yeah, it kind of is, because you can, I mean, that's the whole game is like, gravel is this multi-dimensional type of riding. It's not only aggressive, it's not only road. So you're like trying to balance all these terrains in one ride or in one bike, essentially. And yeah, the 40 can like, you know, you can get your teeth rattled a little bit and you'll be like, okay, enough is enough, but you will have been able to get through it. What pressure are you running 45s at? I read a thing recently that blew my whole mind about uh, rider weight, tire size, and pressure. And it like, I've been going way too high on everything. It was saying to do it like 30s or 20s on some stuff. And I was like, I've never, 20s? Oh, cool, yeah. What I would mean, you do a 45 at? Well, I'm running my 40s at 31 to 33 PSI. So if 45, <laughs> you should be able to go lower than that. You know? I, I, th dude, that's like the ingrain from like 18 track bike tires. Just like, oh, oh yeah. 220. Yeah. All, everything. <laughs> yeah. I've been lucky because I've been able, I, I'll just ask Cameron Falconer what he likes and then I'll try that and then go from there. And he definitely got me going lower than I normally had been. Yeah. It, I, I mean, it's like embarrassing to say like the, cause I so was so ignorant to this, that the lower the pressure you go, the more tire you get. So you don't yeah. even need a bigger tire. You just need to keep dropping pressure. <laughs> and it could be, it could have lower roll. Sometimes lower pressures are actually lower rolling resistance and thus faster, depending on what the does terrain. that mean? So like there was some people doing tests uh, a few years ago, actually on road tires, and a lot of roadies started dropping their pressures because they were doing these roll resistance tests where they were rolling these bikes and they were doing you know yeah 120 psi and then they're like 95 and they're like whoa that 95 psi tire actually like rolled way faster than the 120 oh, um, fascinating it was faster not yeah. just control yeah i had a friend who was winning all these time trials with these really low pressures like oh. total time trial bikes with like skinny tires and he was running like sub 100 psi pressures and just smoking them um, so Fuck, there was, cool. there was, yeah. So like, you know, mountain, my mountain bike, I think I'm running 20 PSI right now. What size? 2.1? 2.4. 4 at 20. Okay. And I could probably even go lower. I mean, what is too low? Just if you're hitting the rim, right? Exactly. Yeah. If you're denting your rim, then you need to like, you know, you go lower and lower until you dent your rim and then you go higher. <laughs> dent not just hit <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so are you would you say you i don't know what that's called rim shock or whatever like hitting the rim no, like at least no, once okay no, okay i have to hit something pretty damn good to hit the rim okay oh yeah. interesting if i hit the rim i know i've got a slow leak okay yeah <laughs> too much you know i've always kind of thought that you were from all the the musical things i've seen from you is like more of a metal head and then, like, a punk rocker? Both. Yeah, both. I don't know. I, I grew up, like, listening to punk from a very early age. Uh, I had a... I looked out upon... I came across a cassette tape when I was in fourth grade, and it had Dead Kennedys on one side and Suicidal Tendencies oh. on the other side. And I was in fourth grade, and I was like... That is awesome. It, like, 
changed my life. You know, I was just like listening to the Dead Kennedys back then. It was just like that guy is mad. Yeah. And, and also, it seems like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> like, Perfect and, storm. And being that he knows what he's talking about, when he tells somebody to fuck off, he can do it so much more eloquently. Like it really like kind of like made me think about ways to be anti-authoritarian as a kid and still get away with it. It was that you had to have a better argument than the adult did. Um, and so that was um, an interesting politically kind of an interesting game changer to me. Cause like if someone yelled at me at school, if I could counter with a better argument, they would just finally be like, just never mind, you know, like, cool. Um, so that was really inspirational and metal wise. That was just something that I got into, um, training for road a lot. I just spent endless hours on the road with headphones and would just go down the, the, um, rabbit hole with metal just like listening to one band after another just like you know when you spend that much time on the road with headphones in you run out of stuff to listen to yeah so you go deeper and deeper and deeper and uh so yeah huh cool and there's something about listening to black metal while you're riding through the fog in the marin headlands i don't know if you've ever done that but no i haven't but that sounds uh it sounds like very good pairing what do they oh, say with that Pacific Northwest, man? Like riding in those fo- like yeah, I guess so. wet forests, some good black metal. It's too that might be too real, too close, too too yeah. much. <laughs> What's your first memory of cycling? Oh, I totally remember the first time I rode without training wheels. Like I, t- I, I have the most vivid vision of it, and I think this is why bikes have been so huge for me. Um like every time like bikes have always i remember it so vividly as a little kid in sacramento um my i had a bike with training wheels i was really really little and my it was the classic thing where your dad takes your training wheels off and goes along the sidewalk with you and you're on your you know i was on my bike and it didn't have training wheels but my dad had my back and and i was riding and i was like whoa you know and then I realized I didn't feel him holding me anymore and I was still riding and I looked back and he was way down the road and I was like, Oh man, I can go so far now. Like, and I just kept going and I went down like to, there was like an underpass with some railroad tracks and and I was so fired up and, um, and, uh, yeah, I have just the most vivid memory of that. So that's my first such a cycling rite of passage that story right there do you remember that yeah you remember same story that's my story <laughs> i mean it's, it's very similar you know helping you walk and ride beside you and then i was actually on like a, there was like this little dirt road behind a house that we were living and just like where was that where was this in fargo north dakota uh-huh. and just like I feel like I was a little slower off the training wheels than some of the other kids. So I was like, I got to fucking do this now. And then got him off and was like freaked out because I didn't really know how to like turn without him. Because <laughs> you know, yeah. first it's just like go straight. <laughs> yeah. OK, but do you have a moment like my moment with that Trek Antelope where where you had like a like a wait a minute, like this, this might be something really serious for me. Hmm. My first memory of cycling, which is not the question that you asked, is my dad would ride me on the back of his 10 speed, like the kid on the back thing. And just like being on a bike as a kid and then the training wheels. And I don't. Yeah, like talking about when I met you, you were riding the track. You were messengering in San Francisco when I met you. Right. What led to that? Like, where did you end up? How did that end up happening? I totally fell into being a bike messenger in Sacramento. Like I was interning at this skate snow music magazine called Heckler. And the it was this shared office with this guy that had like a small messenger. It was like him and his and his partner, um, 
like legal company and he was like, hey, we need somebody. No, th- I, I've said this story before, but it's pr- kind of crazy. I was sitting in the office with the editor. I was like, hey, I got to find a job. Like, you know, I, what do you think I should do? And the guy was like, what do you want to do? I was like, skate shop or maybe a music store or being a bike messenger would be cool. And we're like, okay, whatever. Go on about the day. And later that day, this guy comes in the office and is like, hey, do you know anyone who wants to be a bike messenger? And he was like, yeah, this guy. And he's like, cool, you're hired. See, see me before you leave or something. But and, and that really did change my path because I was focused on like skate and mu- uh, skate and photography and music mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. But I knew even in Fargo as like a teenager that I wanted to like the real world had that dude puck who might have been. Oh, were you oh. living in San Francisco during that time? No, I was a messenger in Portland then. So, so people would be like, do you know? Do you know Puck? Oh, I bet. I don't have a TV, man. I'm like a fucking punk. I don't know who Puck is. It's not. He's not. From what I hear, he's not an actual bike messenger. Yeah, and that was kind of the thing too. But that's how I even heard about what a bike messenger was through MTV in Fargo, North Dakota, and I was like, "That fucking what is that?" (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) So yeah, like. So that was the moment. What were you riding? It when in when Fargo, messengering. In oh okay in Sacramento. Yeah, I guess I had a. It was a Gary Fisher. I don't even remember the model. It was like uh-huh. this crappy Gary Fisher bike that I actually got when. So I lived in Portland. Um, the the day after high school graduation, I moved to Portland, Oregon. Lived there for a year, and just <laughs> was, yeah, similar story to you, like not knowing what to do, depressed, just like f- fucking like kind of hating it and just hitting my Andrews like I got to just leave cuz I'm not doing anything here. And there was a bike in the basement of the apartment I lived in that did not move the whole time I lived there and I was like I'm taking this bike. <laughs> so I took it and it and it was I'm stoked that I did because then I had a bike in Sacramento to like start riding and it was I don't know what f- rapid fire shifting uh-huh. thing and i i just what's that mountain bike yeah i mean a, aluminum gary fisher s- nice. something i don't even yeah yeah there you go but that yeah that was great and then from you know then you start riding in like messenger culture and you're like oh there's other bikes in the world like who knew <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean for both of us cycling is like once we kind of figured it out it like totally changed our whole paths yeah yeah i feel like i'll ride till i'm dead it's just it's my thing it's it's kept me alive through so many weird ass things so yeah and it's something we can do into life which is right now is a great example it's like i'm like well i'll ride my bike through this you know i rode it through other bullshit and it got me through it so i'll ride it through this so yeah Yeah, we're lucky to have that well, maybe that's a good, uh, maybe we'll end it on that. Oh, yeah. Go ride your bike. I think the main thing for people right now is just being motivated. You know, there's a lot of, like, shitty news and people yeah. get caught up in a vortex and they're, like, sitting there staring at Instagram all day and it's hard to motivate. But, yo, put the phone down. Get out there. Once you start turning the pedals, the bike will take you somewhere and you'll be in a better place and Maybe you'll end up in front of a blackberry bush and you'll start picking blackberries and you'll be like, damn, I needed this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the kinds of experiences I have. And right now I think they're just crucial. So, so if you're watching this, get on, ride your bike because uh, it'll save your ass. I promise you. Love it. Love it. And also two people should check out uh, Travis's Instagram. It's California Travis. Dude, your photography game is next level. Oh, thanks. I'm just trying to share my ride Dude. with people and, and hopefully inspire them to get on ride and do the same thing. You know, if anybody's ever like, yo, yeah, you like inspired me to get on ride. And I'm like, great. That's what's up. Awesome. Yeah. Glad to hear it. Now inspire me back. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah right. Like keep that. Yeah. That flow you going. So. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, you have changed my life, so I mean, I hope I can do a little bit to inspire you too. <laughs> it's great to talk to you. Yeah, this has been great. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you soon.
right. Okay. Yeah, let's do that corner kiss. That oh, yeah. To. Wait, where are you? <laughs> Wait, I... Damn it, I'm bad at this. Mm -hmm. <laughs>